This is Dr. Beth Miller, and I am here with Dr. Bruce Weniger. Today's date is May 22, 2017, and we are in Atlanta, Georgia at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I am interviewing Dr. Weniger as part of the oral history project, The Early Years of AIDS, CDC's Response to a Historic Epidemic. We are here to discuss your experience during the early years of CDC's work on what would become known as AIDS. Dr. Weniger, do I have your permission to interview you and to record this interview? Certainly. Bruce, you have been a global leader in epidemiology, public health program implementation and operations research, and vaccine safety in fields including HIV, sexually transmitted diseases, and influenza throughout your career. You have also been a leader in training and education and operations research and public health practice, particularly in collaboration with the Field Epidemiology Training Program, the so-called FETP, based on CDC's EIS program in Thailand. For this oral history of AIDS at CDC, we are focusing on the early years, beginning in June 1981, with the publication of the first morbidity and mortality weekly reports on the five cases of pneumocystis carini pneumonia among homosexual men. But the story of CDC's work on AIDS in Asia began several years later. You served in critical leadership roles in CDC's work on HIV AIDS in Asia, specifically in Thailand, initially from 1983 to 1986 as a medical officer assigned to the World Health Organization and the Ministry of Public Health in Bangkok, then as medical epidemiologist in the international activity of the Division of HIV AIDS at CDC, and later from 1990 to 1993 as the founding director of the Thailand Ministry of Public Health U.S. CDC HIV AIDS collaboration. But let's begin with your background. Can you tell me about where you grew up, your early family life, and then where you ended up going to college? Well, let me just start by um, thanking you for this opportunity to collect some memories before they all disappear. I like to say that the gray, the gray on the outside represents transmigration of similarly colored matter from the inside. Uh, I'm a native New Yorker uh, and um, uh, grew up on Long Island, although for some reason people say I don't have a New York accent. That may have been my parents didn't have New York accents. And uh, eventually uh, made my way to uh, uh, university uh, and medical school at UCLA, uh, School of Public Health and School of Medicine. I started out in the School of Medicine and in that first year got interested in public health where you weren't just taking care of one patient at a time, you were taking care of in public health, the community, a, a huge number of patients at a time. And uh, that's where I first got involved with public health activities and interest in CDC. What led you to CDC? First as an EIS officer in 1974 to 1976. Well, I was an I think you have the years wrong. I, I was an EIS officer from 80 to 82, okay. But in my freshman year at UCLA School of Medicine, it was uh, basically 1974, 73, 74. And at that time, there, the smallpox eradication program was underway in uh, all over the world, but mostly then in India and Bangladesh, having recently been eliminated, cases being eliminated in, in, in uh, Africa, except for the final Somalia case. And um, there was a, 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 an increase in cases in Bangladesh that led Stan Foster, who was leading the smallpox eradication program in Bangladesh to need a lot of expatriate epidemiologists to help solve the problem. So the word went out to people around the world, we need a lot of warm bodies who know a little epidemiology. And uh, uh, Davida Cody was one of the recruiters. She was a, a former uh, WHO smallpox epidemiologist who was teaching on the faculty part-time at UCLA. And mm. she recruited a number of people 
affiliated with the UCLA School of Public Health, Peter Dropman, myself, Bob Perry, and, and others. And we flew off in the summer between my freshman and sophomore years at UCLA School of Medicine to become epidemiologists in the eradication program in Bangladesh. And another oral history I did a few years ago with David Sensor interviewing are in the Global Smallpox Chronicles where I talk about that experience. So that exposed me to Stan Foster. Andy Agle was the administrative officer who would give us stacks of bills to pay off workers in outbreak uh, uh, surveillance and containment activities. And uh, that got me interested in public health in general. And I met people from CDC. And then uh, afterwards, I, there was a role model there. I think his name was Sander Greenland, but I'd have to check. My memory is beginning to fade who had been an EIS officer, and I became interested in the EIS, but knew I had to finish um, medical training and at least internship and maybe some residency. So I ended up uh, going into pediatric training at the University of Utah, and uh, there I think Harry Hill was also was on the faculty, and, and he had been an ex-CDC person. And finally, after two years of residency there, an internship and one year of residency, I decided Clinical pediatrics was not for me, uh, and I applied to the EIS program and was accepted and went into the Parasitic Diseases Division as an EIS officer. What a great medical school experience. Well, I must say I was paid uh, a standard per diem by WHO for my three months, and I remember Stan Foster was a little angry at me because he, ne he wanted me to extend beyond three months, but I had to get back to school. St school was starting in a few days, and I had to get on an airplane and leave, and so I, I, he, he eventually forgave me. In fact, even though I was not a CDC employee at the time of working on smallpox, he was kind enough to give me one of those ribbons that we wear in our uniforms indicating we were smallpox wow. uh, campaign uh, uh, workers. That's uh, terrific. Um, so you, you uh, landed in parasitic diseases. Um, what, what did you work on? And, and uh, at that point, were you touching on some of the early, early HIV AIDS work? Well, my main assignment was in the creepy crawly critters, as I like to call them, uh, worms, helminthic diseases, uh, uh, schistosomiasis, surveillance, and, and things like that. Although there was an epidemic of uh, amoebic meningoencephalitis at Disney World that I got involved with writing up the, the uh, MMWR article. But in relation to the uh, purpose of this oral history related to CDC's AIDS um, history, I do recall there were, it was a small group, Mike Schultz, Myron Schultz was the director who passed away uh, not long ago. Mm. Dennis Juranic was the deputy director, Peter Shantz was a staff member, and the EIS officers at that time, G. Alexander or Sandy Carden, who became an infectious disease specialist in Florida, Isabel Guerrero, who went on to work at the uh, uh, New Jersey Department of Health, and myself. And we used to take turns handling phone calls for the parasitic disease drug service. At that time, the clerk involved with the the Parasitic Disease Drug Service with Sandy Ford, and she's become famous in all the history books about the AIDS epidemic. And I do recall every five, four, five, six days we would take call, either during the day if calls came in or at night the CDC switchboard would call us. It says, we have a doctor in somewhere who's got a patient who needs one of these drugs. So we used to carry these forms with us or have them at our desk. And I remember they were pink forms. And on the form, we'd have the name of the doctor, the institution, the hospital where the patient is, the name of the patient, some demographic background, and what disease they had that needed the various drugs that were of such rare use in the U.S. No drug company bothered to take the time and effort to get them licensed in the U.S. But, so we had these drugs under investigational uh, uh, new drug uh, applications that we can provide. And I do recall over a period of several weeks, maybe some months, beginning to get patients who needed pentamidine for pneumocystis carinii pneumonia. And we'd get through the form and they'd check off pneumocystis, check the box, and what was the underlying diagnosis. And we had several, you know, cancer treatment, chemotherapy, immune suppression from steroids. And I do recall getting the doctor saying he doesn't, where the patient doesn't have 
any of those. And I didn't think anything of it. I just said none or not known or unknown. And the next day we drop it in Sandy Ford's box and I maybe had three or four like this over a period of time I can't remember and the others in the office began to do that. And it was only Sandy who recognized that something was going on and she, would, she told Mike Schultz uh, and that's what led at the same time, we were starting to get reports from New York and San Francisco, physicians who were seeing patients with this uh, opportunistic infection. And that eventually led to the article that Sandy Cardin, I think, was involved in, the first article about these cases of pneumocystis with unexplained, unknown underlying conditions that led them to have these opportunistic infections. And I regret that my index of suspicion was so low when the doctor said he doesn't have any of those just check and didn't think anything of it and put it in the box. Good so, for Sandy Ford. Yeah, uh, yeah. I had worked for her in tuberculosis. She has since passed. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was, that was great epidemiology. Let's, let's move on to your field epidemiology training program assignment in Thailand. So this mm -hmm. was soon after EIS, 1983 to 1986. How did that all happen? How did you wind up getting this FETP assignment in mm -hmm. Thailand? Well, my two year, in the second year of my two years in the parasitic disease division as an EIS officer, I signed up for the preventive medicine residency program, which required a third year. So from 82 to 83, I went out to the state health department in Oregon, uh, which was required if you were Atlanta-based, you went out to the field or vice versa for the PMR program. And during that period of time, um, Philip Brockman, who had started the Global EIS program, had arranged with the government of Thailand, the Ministry of Public Health there before I was involved, to start a, in a sense, son or daughter of EIS. At that time, it was called the Global EIS, although that name was changed for not being very politically correct. And they were looking for someone to replace the first CDC advisor, who was David Brandling Bennett, who went on later to be a deputy director at the PAHO in Washington, and then later moved on to uh, the Gates Foundation. He might still be there today, I, I, I'm not certain. And so we were looking for someone to replace him as the second FETP advisor, to be detailed to the WHO, which was officially sponsoring and funding the program, and that's how I ended up in Thailand uh, from 83 to 86. What about you? What, what, did you have the travel bug, or what made you go ahead and decide to do that? Well, I think having worked in medical school in uh, the smallpox program, and then later on in medical school, I did a summer parasitology, um, I guess you might call it a, a fellowship uh, from the International Centers for Medical Research and Training in Costa Rica, where I worked in a laboratory at the uh, big uh, public hospital, you know, doing stool specimens and looking for eggs of various parasites and had become sort of a, uh, a parasitic uh, fan or uh, interest. Uh, and uh, Was there anything, some often in international world we find that people, parents were missionaries or a variety of reasons that people, was there anything in your background that would suggest that you'd well, be so interested in international work? Well, interestingly, not in a family sense, but years later, I was looking through some old papers I saved from my application to Brown University when I was a high school student. You know, the one-page essay you write, completely forgotten about it. I pull it out of the filing cabinet along with other memorabilia, and I, I wrote that I had wanted to go into the Foreign Service. And I was interested in international affairs, and my goal was to be in the Foreign Service. I completely forgot about that. And uh, maybe there was something about the exotic nature of going to other cultures and, and so forth. Uh, but I, I, I also had had an overseas experience in Costa Rica prior to the medical one when I uh, volunteered for a summer project at Brown University to work in Costa Rica to be assigned to a Peace Corps volunteer in the bu in not really the bush in the mountains and that mm. was another positive experience in a small mm. village. I brought my family back decades later to visit these people that in my early photographs when I made new prints children who were five or six were now in their 30s and 40s and having their own children so it was a great experience. 
So you get to, to Thailand in 1983. Um, what was the working environment like for you in this assignment? Who was your supervisor and were you beginning to get a sense that you might be focusing on uh, HIV at all in the early years? Well, the, the Thai program was modeled on the CDC program, although it didn't have the depth of expertise in other parts of the ministry that we have here in the, in the U.S. CDC. The EIS officers are numbering 50, 60, 70, are assigned throughout the agency to working under more senior staff, often themselves EIS alumni, to learn the ropes doing on-the-job epidemiology, and that's the way it worked there, but there were only like five trainees per year. And we had a course that instead of having only ministry um, faculty to teach statistics, epidemiology, all the related, all the kinds of components of the course that's taught here. We recruited people from the major medical schools, the preventive medicine departments, mm -hmm. community medicine departments in Bangkok to come and teach and teach them. And basically it was similar to the CDC. We'd get a report of a problem, um, diphtheria in Yasatone province uh, or uh, um, other usually infectious diseases um, occurring in out and of various types. And uh, sometimes I'd go out with the trainees, sometimes I'd go out on their own. The difference was, though, that in the U.S., telephone communications were quite easy. We didn't have cell phones in that era, but you could get on the phone at your motel that night or in the health local health department and call back to your supervisor in Atlanta. But not so easy to do that in, in Thailand uh, uh, to make those long-distance calls. So you were doing mentoring and teaching. Um, as you were there for several years, during the later years, there was the beginning of seeing AIDS patients in Thailand. Um, what did you work on initially on that? Well, that era, 83 to 86, was when the first AIDS cases had, well, before I left uh, CDC in 82, of course, they, we were already getting the reports of this strange new disease uh, of, uh, of unexplained opportunistic infection. So in the 83 to 86 period, the, inf the causative organism had been discovered, and eventually by, I guess it was 85, mm -hmm. we had a, 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 uh, a laboratory assay to test people who were asymptomatic but infected. And I remember on one of my visits back to HQ here in Atlanta, uh, r related to the FETP, I went over to see Jim Curran, who had been placed in charge of the, I think it was called the Task Force on Opportunistic Infections. You know, I may, I may be getting the uh, That's it. the names, dip, you know, not corresponding to the appropriate year, and the Abbott test kits to detect HIV had just been licensed and were just coming out, but not widely available. And I said, you know, we have a lot of risk categories in Thailand, that, and there might be case infections there, no cases yet. Um, and shall we, you know, get some of these kits? If you'll send them to me, we'll we'll run them. And so he sent us through the diplomatic pouch or the APO, uh, which uses the same facility, enough Abbott tests to run 600 specimens. Mm. And so we. The what did, who did what? Did, group did you pick to do your first testing? Well, and we did this through the FETP. Dr. Wang Lung Sop is uh, one of our trainees, became the principal investigator, and we rounded up six groups, uh, about 100 um, blood donors, 100 uh, male prostitutes, 100 female prostitutes, um, a hundred men coming to STD clinics because they had an STD, but I'm up to 400, 500, and then another hundred um, thalassemia patients mm. who had received frequent blood transfusions. We figured out if it was in the blood supply, uh, we might pick that up. And there was one more risk group I'm forgetting. And of those 600 specimens, we found one positive who was a male prostitute. So what was the thinking right from the get-go that's so amazing that you were there at that early earliest moment after 
you know, we're already seeing this rapid up, upswing in the U.S., in Africa, we're already knowing mm -hmm. that. Um, what, were the, what was thinking among the Thai public health leadership? Well, at that time, you know, a, Asia was considered, most of Asia was considered the so-called pattern three country where there really was, were very few cases, mostly imported ones. But I think what we saw doing that survey, and it may very well have been the first detection of HIV infection in Asia. Mm -hmm. By that time, there were cases in report of AIDS reported in Japan, and uh, around that time, we also had our first AIDS case reported in Thailand. But we didn't know what was going on in the in the general population in terms of the blood the mm -hmm. the blood of the pop of the population whether the virus was sitting there because we I think we guessed that it was could be several years or many years before AIDS became a patent uh, symptomatic. Uh, illness and we wanted to find out. So I think that may have been the very first, because we got the kits before they went elsewhere in the, in the world that were just being distributed by Abbott. So was there a sense of relief in terms of just seeing one or was it a sense of doom or what, what was the uh, response? Of? Well, I think everyone was expecting it, that it wasn't going to stay in North America and Europe. And I think one positive thing about my counterparts and colleagues in the Ministry of Public Health of Thailand, unlike many of the other countries in Asia, there was not an attempt to hide it, and that they were very open about doing the research, allowing it to be published, that we had these cases. We, and for a number of years after that, other countries were fighting, or epidemiologists in other countries, ministries of health, were struggling with the politicians mm -hmm. who didn't want to reveal that they had this problem because mm -hmm. of course everyone denies they have the risk category the risk behaviors and categories that lead to it so sometime I think it was about 1985 the epidemiology division at the Ministry of Public Health in Thailand where the FEDP and I were based received our first notification of an AIDS case in Thailand it came from Dr. Anawat Limsuan an infectious disease specialist at the nearby Ramatipiti Hospital of Mahidon University and it caused a lot of excitement <laughs> because mm -hmm. everyone was waiting, mm -hmm. when was it gonna come to this country? And I recall there must have been 10 or 12 people, senior staff of the epidemiology division, mid-level staff of the epidemiology division, FETP trainees or their equivalent of EIS officers and myself getting into vehicles to drive the mile or two to the hospital and surrounding this patient's mm -hmm. bed you know, very politely and calmly uh, asking him questions. It turned out he had been a student, a, a Thai student, at one of the two universities in Louisiana. It's either Tulane or LSU, mm. I forget which one. I can probably look it up. Who had been actually diagnosed in the United States. And he was basically coming home to die because in that era there were no treatments. And oh. the, the staff were you know, asking him questions and, and, and whatnot, and that became the very first case. Um, mm. And then before long, we had a few more, and later cases had never been out of the country. So those were autochthonous cases, as we say, that mm. they acquired the infection somewhere or somehow yeah. in Thailand from somebody else. Um, on the side, I, I'm aware that you have a Thai wife. Did you meet your Thai wife during this uh, period at the FETP? Uh, yes, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, I had the opportunity to accompany a Vietnamese refugee um, from Thailand to the United States along with her family and maybe a few dozen others because she was an elderly woman who, with a heart condition and they wanted a doctor to go on the flight. And the head of the medical operations uh, at the IOM, International Organization for Migration, I think they may have changed their name, it used to be ICM, I, International Committee for Migration, was Roland Sutter. And I had known Roland Sutter uh, as another uh, physician in, in Bangkok at that time, and he asked me if I'd like to accompany this woman. I said, sure, I, there's an epidemiology conference in Vancouver uh, around that time, and I could use it to get a free trip to the United States and, and uh, get administrative leave or personal leave, I can't remember wh which I used. So I accompanied her and we took her to uh, uh, her 
family picking her up in uh, uh, Orange County, California at the John Wayne Airport waiting for the family to show up and all the young women in the family uh, had uh, on the airplane put on their traditional Vietnamese dresses to, to be prepared to meet their uh, the previous relatives who had escaped on boats five or ten years earlier and uh, had already been established uh, in, in, in California. And then I flew up to Vancouver where I met my wife. Uh, someone pointed out that woman over there is from Thailand. She had been getting her PhD in Germany and was presenting at the Epidemiology Association conference and one thing led to another. That's great. So you met your Thai wife in Canada. Well, I shouldn't say Vancouver because that's one of my secret questions on, you know, websites, you know, where <laughs> did you meet your wife? So I, hopefully no one watching this will uh, will use that information. So then you came up uh, came back briefly to Atlanta and you worked in the international activity of the Division of HIV AIDS. And with your supervisor, Dr. Bill Hayward, you set up the HIV AIDS Field Research Center in Bangkok as a collaboration between the Thai Ministry of Public Health and CDC. So how did this come about? Why, why Thailand? Well, Jim Carn was still running the HIV AIDS program at CDC and asked uh, Bill Hayward, William Hayward, to set up some international field sites and be become his, his um, point person for international activities uh, regarding HIV AIDS. And he had had some difficulties trying to find sites around the world to, to do that. And I think the fact that I had the previous experience in Thailand, getting to know a lot of the officials in the Ministry of Public Health and the, the early trainees were now moving into positions around the Ministry of Public Health. He, brought me on board his program to, with the primary mission to set up a program. It probably took about a year, maybe 18 months, of going back and forth and talking to people at the Ministry of Public Health that the CDC would like to work with you to set up a collaborative program. And as I mentioned earlier, the Thais were quite open and receptive to research and, and, and very um, uh, enlightened about you know, solving this problem and studying this problem and getting the assistance of CDC. And so we eventually formally started this project. I sh think I showed up in September of 1990. Mm -hmm. And I was the only American at that time. And then I was soon joined by uh, uh, Nancy Young, the only other expatriate during my entire term there who was assigned to Thailand, who became the director of our laboratory. And I must say that once we got the green light, Yes, you can set up a program. We face the inevitable problem in all governments, space. And I remember going from one department of the ministry to the other saying, you know, the ministry would like uh, to have a joint research program, but we need some space. And so I, CDC now moving into more international work. Was the office of the director of CDC supportive of, of these field stations? There was one in, uh, there had been one in uh, Zaire, which right around then I think had to be closed down. Mm -hmm. And then uh, also in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire. But now we're moving into Asia, which didn't yet have all that much HIV. Um, did you have the support both at the OD and also from Washington to do this? Well, as the assignee, negotiating this and writing up a multi-page uh, agreement, a memorandum of understanding. I presume Jim Kern took care of that with his boss at the time. Uh, was it Bill Fagy? I can't remember who was the head of CDC in, from, 80, from 90 to 93, but I, I wasn't really involved with, with his communications to the higher levels, but the funding was there, the interest was there, the will was there, and so I was basically dealing with it writing up the, the agreement that the Thais would sign and the CDC would sign. In fact, a, f a few months after we started it, Jim came to Thailand uh, with Helene Gale, who was then his international activity um, point person, and we had a lovely ceremony, and he signed the agreement, and we were off. But uh, as I was mentioning earlier, I had to go searching for space. I didn't want to rent private space. We probably had the funds to rent 
commercial office space in a building near the ministry. But and I, in those I, days, you could do that. In those days, now, you could do that, I suppose. Yeah. And now everything is more complicated. Right. But I thought if it was really going to be a joint project, and we really wanted to emphasize it wasn't just the CDC setting up an outpost. So we hired as our, or had, we had assigned to us as our Thai director, uh, Dr. Kanchit Limpakarn Janarat, who had been not only a graduate of the Thai FETP, but he had been brought into the US EIS where he did that two year program. Mm -hmm. So he had the experience of both worlds and he became the, the co director of the Thai director of the program. So we finally found at that point in time, the ministry had moved from a very crowded campus on the river in downtown Bangkok up to the suburbs where they had what must be hundreds of acres of land far larger than this campus at, on Clifton Road at, at CDC. Mm -hmm. And they were built all these uh, amazing uh, uh, buildings, huge buildings for their far-flung um, um, organizational chart activities. And it turns out that one of the buildings was most, was most had a lot of empty space. And so the director of the Department of Medical Sciences, which was responsible for laboratory research, said, well, you can have this floor over here, but there's one requirement. You pay your own electric meter. <laughs> and we said, fine. And so we eventually contracted Terrific. through the embassy to bring in, uh, to build all the walls and the partitions and the plumbing and, and everything to have a laboratory on one side and the epidemiologist on the other. So at that time, Thailand is still pretty much of a lower income country. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, advanced quite a bit over the last few decades. But um, what was Tell us a little bit about the government of Thailand or the ministry in terms of their role in this, their expectations, other in other international work. CDC has had to do quite a bit of negotiating in terms of uh, being accepted and clarifying who does what. What was it like uh, in Thailand? Well, as I mentioned, space in all government agencies, whether it's CDC or the Ministry of Health in Thailand, is always up at a premium, and we were lucky to find some space. And I think, but another a difference, I think, between my experience in the U.S. government and my experience over there is that each of the departments of the ministry there were like sovereign entities. You know, here we have the center for this and the center for that and the center for something else, but if the big boss at the top says, you're going to do something, and you're going to, these two centers are going to work together to do something, it gets done. But there, every department was like its own sovereign silo. And sometimes uh, uh, there were difficulties getting cooperation um, because they were always defending their resources and their turf and so forth. Um, were the Thais putting in financial resources into this? They were putting in the salaries of, of Dr. Kanchit and others, but most of the, the electric bill, the construction of the project, and they were not charging us rent, so they were basically contributing okay. Okay. facilities. And when things needed to be done or cooperation to do studies around the country, local and regional health departments were helping out. So there was uh, there were contributions in kind, as, mm -hmm. as, as they say. Now, I do recall one experience in, in setting these things up, is that um, previously in Thailand, and still remaining today, a major U.S. Army medical research facility had existed for decades, the formerly known as the Southeast Asia, Asia Treaty Organization, or CETO Lab became the Armed Forces Research Institute of Medical Sciences with a U.S. component of U.S. Army and other services uh, researchers and Thai, a Thai component working mm. in the same building or next door. And we were, the CDC coming into that turf was a bit of a, a, a interloper, a bit of wow. a, a new, new one on the block. And I think when we first began the project, we had courtesy calls with them and were explaining what we were going to be doing. And, and I think they were a little bit uh, hesitant uh, or that they were now going to be two U.S. government agencies doing medical research. And they were doing everything from dengue, hepatitis, uh, Japanese encephalitis, and we were going to be focused on just one, HIV AIDS. But we did cooperate and, and, uh, uh, and avoided uh, and, and collaborated in, in some ways. In fact, Previously, when I had been the FEDP advisor, the AFRAMS, the U.S. Army Laboratory, was of tremendous help in running laboratory tests. There would be an outbreak of hepatitis, and the trainees would go out and collect a bunch of specimens, 
and either the ministry didn't have the resources or the time to be able to run those specimens, Afrin's was happy to do that. And so they, had, they were really a great resource for the country and the ministry in, in that respect. So in 1990, um, it's clear that HIV AIDS epidemic in Thailand and Asia overall, like Africa, is primarily a heterosexual epidemic um, and risk groups in injecting drug users, female sex workers, their clients, and so on, and then into the blood and blood product recipients. According to an AIDS in the World survey in 1987, there were less than 1,000 adults with HIV in Southeast Asia. But by 1990, when you get there, about 138,000. And by 1993, 1.5 million infected adults in, in, a in Southeast Asia. So you were there during this explosive rise of HIV in Thailand. So can you tell us a little bit about the changing view of HIV in the ministry and among academicians in Thailand. Now they're starting to see this explosive epidemic. Was there fear? Was there stigma? Was there intellectual curiosity, I'm sure? Well, if I can diverge a little bit from the question, I think Jim Curran and Bill Hayward starting the joint collaboration with Thailand was very prescient because we were fortunate to be in place and working closely with the FETP and the Epidemiology Division in the next building over, which was continuing to do sentinel surveys, we were able to, together, to basically document the entry and explosive growth of HIV infection in Thailand in real time, mm. to use that expression. In 84, 85, 86, there had been a few serial surveys that didn't find much of anything until we found that one, uh, one patient out of 100 uh, uh, male prostitutes uh, that had the infection. And then all of a sudden, um, the epidemic curve just went like this in early 1988, where it went, I don't recall the exact numbers, they're in the review articles, uh, um, went from close to zero to like 20%, 30%, 35% in injecting drug users. And the Tanyarak Hospital of the ministry, which was a drug abuse treatment hospital, was testing every new and, and readmitted um, patient coming in for drug treatment. So they had tens of thousands of, 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 uh, res of results, and the numbers were just remarkable. And then the Ministry of Public Health began sentinel surveys in various provinces of different risk groups. And we could, we could sort of watch the epidemic go from the first wave in drug users, and then all of a sudden, female prostitutes working in low-cost brothels, the curve was rising rapidly over a period of just months. And then a third wave in the male STD patients, and then eventually a fourth wave where the men who had been uh, visiting prostitutes were bring the infections home to their wives, and we'd see an increase in, in, in infection rates among women, general population women coming for antenatal care because they were pregnant, and then eventually the infants of these pregnancies uh, where the mothers had been infected. So it, it seemed to go from one wave to the next, although we later learned from genetic analysis that Chinyi O uh, uh, at CDC, the laboratory uh, researcher who had worked on the Florida dentist case and proving by genetic analysis that the dentist had given the infection to one or more of his patients, that the virus that caused the outbreak in, that was infecting male homosexuals was not the same virus that was infecting heterosexuals. It was almost like two epidemics uh, occurring in parallel but not caused by the same virus. Mm. And, th and that segregation was sort of unusual because I myself had presumed, well, the drug addicts had sex with women and then that's how it got into the prostitutes, but they were two separate viruses. We called them subtype B, similar to the MN and SF strains from the United States and Europe. 
and then this new one that we called originally subtype E, which now is called EA because it's sort of a mixture of E and A. Uh, and that segregation continued for quite some time. And now E is the most predominant strain in the country. And it spread into Cambodia, into southwest China, into Myanmar, and into northeastern India. Even though that wasn't the predominant one in injection drug users, or, or was oh, no, it? That, that was also, that, yeah, injection drug users had B, probably oh. because they acquired it in prisons. Okay. And the prisoners, the prisons had been infected by foreigners who may, may be arrested for, uh, we're, we're presuming that, because we knew before the great, uh, the annual uh, pardons of prisoners that there had been HIV in prisons from studies that were, had been done among prisoners. So um, at this point, again, there's still no treatment, but was there a sense of panic, of an emergency, that we need to do something? How did, how did that, um, how did the sense of policy uh, respond early on. We know later on Thailand was a real leader in terms of how it well, responded, but at this early phase. Well, I think the public in Thailand pretty much reacted as the public did in many other countries. Fear, isolation, turning AIDS cases into pariahs. Um, I mean, Thailand experienced that as well. Uh, what did help, though, was uh, that Fairly early on, uh, the ministry, or the government basically, established a national AIDS committee, and they put some really remarkable people in charge of it, the famous Michai Viravatiya, the family health planning, family planning uh, guru of the country, uh, became involved in HIV prevention as well. Uh, infectious disease specialist Persert Tongcharon uh, were appointed this committee, and they became involved in getting all the um, components of society, the press, schools, all the ministries to get to be involved in, in terms of uh, public education and risk uh, uh, reduction and, and so forth. A lot of what was done during all of these years relied on the foundation of a strong surveillance system. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? What was the infrastructure like and what was the quality of the surveillance system mm -hmm. that uh, did so much important work during mm -hmm. those early years? Well, when I was the second FETP advisor in the early uh, 1980s, the Division of Epidemiology had a fairly uh, good surveillance system in and a, basically a, a similar product as the MMWR. They called it their weekly epidemiological surveillance report. And one of the things I, I, I mentioned to the trainees that were under my tutelage was that surveillance is a two-way street. It's not just collecting information from the periphery and bringing it to the center and keeping it there but turning it around and sending it back out so that the people at the grassroots in provincial or regional health departments can see that when they report, something happens. An epidemic gets investigated. They okay. report an epidemic, it got investigated. They see their numbers on the chart. And uh, by the time I got there in 83, they had already set up a computerized system for um, uh, reporting cases. Uh, I think the cases came in on paper, but they were computerized at the, at the uh, central level and they would publish a weekly epidemiological surveillance report similar to the yeah. MMWR. And, uh, and so with that, more and more reports would start to come in, and the trainees, as the, their staffing levels permitted, would be able to go out and try to work up uh, these problems. That's very impressive. And they were not hiding the AIDS, AIDS cases. Every few months, there'd be a summary of AIDS cases or HIV infections detected by the uh, serial surveys, which was quite more enlightened than, uh, than uh, many other countries in that uh, part of the world mm. in terms of the early epidemic. How were you involved at all in doing validation studies of surveillance systems? How, 
how did uh, how did you as a CDC leader interface with priorities along this line? I don't think w we had the time <laughs> to get involved in that. I and mean, we were doing uh, zero, we were involved in, in a num number of areas uh, for research and sort of higher level um, assessments of how the ministry was doing surveillance. The, the HIV AIDS collaboration itself was not doing surveillance. We were relying on our po colleagues and partners in the ministry to okay. do that. Okay. We were setting up my, one of my initial goals, and I was basically prompted by Roel Coutinho, who had been an organizer, I think it was the 10th uh, International AIDS Conference in Amsterdam. Okay. And the point I recall him making in one of the key speeches there was, don't just do Me Too epidemiology. You know, we already knew how HIV was spread, what the risk factors were. Don't just do one more study that shows, yes, it's spread by this or risk behavior or that risk behavior. We already had that information from North America and Europe and other countries. Do something that would make a difference in the epidemic. So my priority was to set up the cohort studies, the infrastructure that would allow someday to do vaccine trials. Mm. And so we went to the northernmost province in the country where female prostitution was quite, uh, was, well, it's prevalent everywhere, but we set up relationships with the local um, health department, provincial health department, and set up cohort studies to see how well we could follow these women, test them periodically, and, and give them counseling to try to discourage them from being in this business. But to have that, those infrastructures of staff, and communications and health workers and epidemiologists, Thai nationals mm. w working with the few expatriates, so that when it came time that we had an intervention to test, we have a cohort of high-risk people uh, that could be that could be tested. And so those are the hardest studies. And I think one of the advantages I think that CDC had over our colleagues and, and counterparts at the NIH is that and as the U.S. Army had done before us, they have the long-term commitments. They don't work on three-year or five-year grant cycles where they build up this infrastructure with funding given to American universities. They go overseas. They set up all these projects. And then five years later, the money stops and all the people get fired. But the, the uh, Department of Defense and the CDC can make a long-term commitment. Now, we started the HIV AIDS collaboration around 1990, and it's still in existence. How many of the, and I'm thinking of a number of NIH programs, the PAVE programs for accelerated vaccine, something or other, how many programs are in effect for a few years and then they, they, the researchers, uh, the R01 researchers lose their grants or lose their contracts and it all has to rebuild be rebuilt again. I think that's the great advantage of CDC in that we can make a commitment for long-term funding and long-term support because you need this kind of infrastructure to do the kind of studies that will help produce this, um, studies that will determine does this intervention work or not, does this vaccine work or not, does this uh, prevention of mother-to-child transmission work or not because you have, you can make that long-term commitment that's longer than the assignment period, the tours of duty of individual researchers. Mm -hmm. We've talked a little bit about the zero surveys, um, and you've mentioned some of these, but can you tell us a little bit more about the cultural aspects of these different epidemics uh, in Thailand? For example, what what drove, or what is the, are the theories of what drove the injection drug use epidemic, this incredible rise in the course of a year or two? Well, one theory I have that I think I published um, in uh, an editorial for uh, a paper by Kenrad Nelson and colleagues in the New England Journal was that um, in the early days, opium was the drug of choice. And of course, opium is grown and cultivated in that famous uh, 
um, Golden Triangle where Myanmar and Laos and Thailand uh, meet. And then it's transported uh, uh, along smuggling routes to go to other parts of the world. But smoking opium doesn't transmit HIV. And one of the th theories that I, and there were some, so I had some references to justify this, was as drug suppression efforts became more successful, opium smuggling was replaced with heroin production. Instead of producing the heroin from the opium in Bangkok or other parts of the world, the refineries were located closer to the sources of the opium poppies so that there would be less volume of drug to smuggle and transport. So what was being transported was then heroin, which is injected and thus shared needles can produce HIV and other infections going from one person to another. So ironically, the success of drug suppression helped um, increase the risk of transmission of bloodborne diseases like HIV because now the only way to, to uh, sort of uh, uh, administer these drugs along the routes required sharing needles. Another observation I had was that, you know, under communism, prostitution was suppressed in China and, uh, and, 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 and Cambodia and so forth and other countries. And as these countries industrialized, um, including non-communist countries like Thailand and so forth, people moved from their villages where premarital sex and, and, uh, was uncommon and most of the men would use a small group of prostitutes for sexual services. But as industrialization took place, factory towns and, uh, would be set up and young people to escape from their villages where there was not much work would move to these factory towns where they lost the influence of the village and the family about premarital sex. So more females were in, engaging in premarital sex than in the villages. And this is another factor that, that can lead to a greater transmission of heterosexual uh, diseases. Uh, whether, and, and of course, under communism, sex was, um, uh, was um, sec uh, sexually, uh, se the sex business was suppressed. But as countries like China opened up to capitalism, there was uh, less control of this kind of thing, and commercial sex became more overt. And yeah. so I think that was another explanation of how the epidemic sort of helped, was facilitated by these, these social political um, changes occurring in, in, in countries that industrialize. We, we heard a lot about um, brothel-based female sex work in, in Thailand, that that was a big tourist uh, draw, that uh, the brothels in Bangkok uh, were well known. How did, how did we, we know that that initially contributed. Um, how did that impact on the dramatic rise? Was that a big factor in terms of the increase of HIV in Thailand? Well, let me just provide this disclaimer that I've been away from the HIV AIDS field for quite some time. And the terminology that we used then and now is not the same. There's a lot of political incorrectness or correctness that's enforced. And so uh, if I use terms, commercial sex worker, now there may be new terms to replace this that are considered less, less pejorative. So excuse me if I'm using the terms I recall from that era. We found that there were really two types of female sex workers. The brothel based ones were the ones that were very low cost, $3, $5, $8, and working in, in establishments. They would call them tea houses or, 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 or brothels. And then there were more freelance workers who might work in bars, meet customers, go to a short-stay motel around the corner, or high-class places even. 
and that the rates of HIV were, were different in those places. Now, one of the major contributions, I think, of the Thailand uh, uh, prevention programs for HIV was generated by an FETP graduate named Dr. Wiwat Rochanap Pitayakorn, one of the early graduates, who was working in Ratbury province, facing the epidemic, and he came up with this 100% condom-only campaign, where, although prostitution was technically illegal, the police knew where these places were and people sort of ignored it, but working with the police, he went to these places and set up a program where they were required to use, that the, the, employ, the, the owners of these establishments were mandated to require their employees to always use condoms and if the customer refused to ex explain to the employee, don't have sex with this person. And whenever a case of an STD occurred in a woman from one of these establishments, they considered it prima facie evidence that the owner did not enforce that rule and the police would punish them, close them down for some period of time or enforce it. And this became a nationwide uh, policy that had a tremendous effect. I can't remember the exact numbers, they're in the review article, uh, that led some years later for Dr. Wiwat to be awarded the Prince Mahidon Award of Thailand, which is like considered the Nobel Prize in Asia for, for public health, for having established this program, working with the police uh, and the provincial authorities to enforce this, uh, this rule. Was it easier to control the epidemic in the brothel-based versus the, the bars or the higher class, quote-unquote, uh, settings? I'm not sure I can answer that question, but I think in the early years of the epidemic, one phenomenon I think I noticed was that you can't get people to change their behavior, whether they're young men going to prostitutes or others engaging in sex or sharing needles or whatever the risk behaviors are, you can't get people to change their behavior until they perceive themselves to be at risk. You know, they see it on television, they see public service ads, and they see educational programs in the schools, and uh, I have a picture of uh, Jim Kern and Helene Gale and Dr. Kanchit um, in the hospital in Shanghai when they visited Thailand next to this big mocked AIDS devil, you know, and that, that kind of, you know, some ugly looking red uh, uh, paper mache figure that represented the evil AIDS. I don't think people really pay attention to that until they experience the disease themselves, their son, their daughter, their brother, their sister, their cousin, a neighbor in the town gets this disease and within six months of being symptomatic, they're gone. So I think when that began to happen in Thailand, and when at a certain point in Thailand, 2% of the pregnant women in the country were HIV positive. So this is a random sample of women going to public antenatal clinics. That's a large number. And so when people begin to, to see how this disease is, is affecting their families, their friends, their community, because people are dying down the street or in the same home, in fact, we've lost our own Thai relatives, at least one in Thailand from this disease. So when you finally see that, then I think you recognize that it's time to follow the suggested protective behaviors that you see on television because you now know you are at risk. Mm. So that's my, mm -hmm. my little theory, and I think we saw that in Thailand. What about the foreign tourists? Um, did it affect the business uh, of Thailand? Uh, was that maybe part of the motivation of controlling it so? Well, there is sex tourism in Thailand and many other countries. I think, though, it's fair to say that although it gets a lot of publicity and a lot of pre coverage in the Western press, it's, in terms of prostitution, it probably represents a very small proportion. And I think okay. most acts where money is exchanged for sex in, in Thailand and most other countries is, is not involving foreigners. Mm. And that although sex tourism 
occurs and continues to occur, and uh, it's probably just a small proportion of, uh, of, of prostitution in Thailand and other similar countries. You talk about um, the very impressive Thai response of 100% condom use. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, an area that's, that's certainly been very difficult in the United States but elsewhere as well, and that is the approach to the injection drug users, needle exchange programs. Um, how, how, what was the Thai view of that? Was it implemented and successful? Well, I'm not sure I can really comment uh, with direct uh, knowledge of how that goes. I must say that we did have problems because the legal, the, the law enforcement authorities were often not so cooperative with the drug treatment authorities. And it was sort of, uh, in fact, we did a st studies of trying to estimate the size of the drug abusing population in Bangkok by doing capture recapture studies where we would um, uh, have the, with the cooperation of the drug treatment clinics in the city, have the names and dates of birth of individuals under treatment at a certain point or period of time, and then working with the na national drug control authorities or the or the prisons, we'd have a list of people in jail for drug use. And by cross-linking those two populations to see how much overlap there was, we could calculate the number of drug addicts in Bangkok. I think the number was somewhere between 30 and 40,000 at a, at a point in time. But the problem was that if police are looking for people to arrest for drug use, the likely place is to stand outside the drug treatment clinic as they're walking out or walking in. So these types of things, I think, I'm sure occurred in Thailand and mm. probably occurred in the United States too, that, mm. um, uh, you know, Willie Sutton was famously quoted, you know, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. If you want to address drug, drug users for your quota of needed arrests, you go to the drug treatment centers or nearby. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure I can comment on tr trends in that, in that area. I've been away too long from the country, and uh, although I go back and work there part-time now, um, I don't really follow this, this issue very much. I know in many countries in Asia or Southeast Asia, uh, there was a very negative stigma against drug users. Was mm -hmm. that similar in Thailand? Oh, yeah. There were a number of um, very important areas of research that were conducted in this Thai uh, field station. Um, I know one, one area that you worked on was molecular epidemiology and the different uh, strains of HIV in Asia. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And what's the significance of knowing all that? Well, I think I mentioned earlier the, the discovery, and, and to everyone's surprise, that there were two strains of HIV, not both HIV ones, that were circulating in Thailand and, and segregating by risk category. And that was only made possible by um, doing the genetic analyses. And we worked with um, uh, Sharon Castle from Canada uh, on collecting blood from some neighboring countries, uh, Myanmar, uh, Thailand, uh, China, uh, I may be forgetting which countries we work with, India, where they would send us blood samples from, from infected persons dried onto filter paper. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, when the blood is dried onto filter paper and you keep the flies off of it and, and put it in a glassy envelope, it doesn't need to be um, uh, constitute. It's thermal stable. You don't need to refrigerate it. So we were able to bring that to Bangkok and then send it off to Chinyi Wu in the, at CDC and see what the strains of HIV were in the other. Uh, they were able to get do the genetic analysis on these on these filters and see what other strains of HIV there were of HIV one there were in other countries, and that's what led to the conclusion that the strains of HIV in Thailand, as time went on, were 
moving into Cambodia, mm. moving into southwest China, where they do have an a injecting drug use problem in that era, mm. Myanmar, and, uh, and, and, and other neighboring countries. What was the practical or programmatic significance of that? I think at one point you mentioned uh, in thinking about vaccine trials, uh, other aspects, why, I think it was interesting intellectually, but how did, how did it impact on program? I'm not sure at that point it impacted on program. I think though that now that these genetic studies have continued, that the main target for vaccines studies, vaccine intervention trials, of which there was a famous one conducted by the U.S. Army that for the first time found an effective AIDS vaccine. In its first year after vaccination, it was 60 percent effective, but as more follow-up went on, the immunity wore off and it was only around 31 percent effective. But that was a major mm -hmm. event for the world. I'm very proud that Thailand was the home to that. I think the U.S. Army, uh, working with the Ministry of Health, that conducted these huge trials, 16,000 um, uh, vaccine recipients or placebo recipients, really deserve a lot of credit for finally showing that um, it was possible to have at least a partially effective AIDS vaccine. And when we think of how poorly some of our influenza vaccines do in some years, 60 or 50 percent efficacy, having 60 percent one year after vaccination was not so bad, and going down to 30 percent is is certainly, it's not a home run, but it's at least a, a double to second base. So, uh, um, so I'm proud that they, they did that. And, and, and knowing what the strains are in the country uh, that are circulating, what the targets need, might need to be in the vaccines to be tested uh, is important. Um, there's another area, I, it slipped my mind. I ask another question and I'll, and I, and I'll comment on that. I think from from uh, certainly from my understanding some of the work uh, on prevention of mother to child transmission that took place in Thailand was um, of a watershed in many ways for prevention of mother to child transmission in developing countries but it was uh, it was not an easy component there was there were several components to this so-called AIDS Clinical Trials Group 076 study. Um, can you mention a little bit about that in Thailand and the ethical questions associated with doing a placebo-controlled trial? And much has been written about that since. Well, my involvement uh, in that from 90 to 93 was pretty much, as I mentioned earlier, setting up the infrastructure. So while I was there, we only had two Americans, uh, myself and the laboratory director, and full-time, and maybe a dozen Thai national employees uh, uh, who were working on various projects. But what we did to, to um, solve this problem of needing more epidemiological expertise, we bring short-term consultants from Atlanta. So we had Nathan Schaefer and R.J. Simons, I recall, being involved in the maternal uh, uh, to child transmission studies, but so while I was there, we were making arrangements with the uh, Rajwiti Hospital and Mahidon for various hospitals around town to start these cohort studies, working with the staff at those hospitals to, to, to test mothers and, uh, and, and be ready to do the intervention uh, trials. Those trials took place after I was no longer in, in Thailand, and they did, of course, find that, yes, you could prevent uh, maternal to child transmission with uh, drugs. And that was wonderful. And it only occurred because we had these wonderful relationships with uh, obstetric uh, programs in the city uh, at, the, at the major teaching hospitals uh, that um, made it possible. And that's another example of having these long-term commitments to maintain salaries and subsidies and staff to do research even before you're ready for the intervention, just to do epidemiological research on the proportion of mothers who were infected and what their clinical aspects were and how often the kids were getting infected until we were ready to do these trials. So long-term commitments are necessary, not short-term and medium-term grant grants that run out. It's phenomenal how, uh, 
how wonderful the relationship really sounds like from the perspective of the Thai and U.S. collaboration. Um, any thoughts you have on, on why that was so good? Other, other countries, it's not been quite as easy. Um, is it the Thai people? Is it the long relationship that they originally had with the U.S. Army? Um, well, I think in Asia in general, in Thailand as well, um, personal relationships count for a lot. I think the reason we were successful in starting the HIV AIDS collaboration, now it's called the TUC, it has a, it's changed its name, was because we had been there before with the FETP and how Philip Brockman arranged to start the FETP, I was not there at the time. So personal relationships and trust have a lot to do with it. In fact, that brings up an, a subject that I hope we'll have a chance to talk about, which is scientific competition. Because in my experience there, as the founder and runner of this re research activity, I saw how the, I saw the negative aspects of hyper-competitive scientific work. I mentioned earlier that the U.S. Army research facility there, AFRIMS, uh, medical research facility, was a little bit uncomfortable with this new player on the block from CDC that was going to focus on HIV and AIDS, but they went along with us and helped us out and, and gave us advice. But once I was there, I noticed coming from both certain individuals at CDC and elsewhere, how scientific competition can do a lot of damage. Or my philosophy in working in Thailand is that we always had to remember we were the guests and our host was the country of Thailand, the people of Thailand, the Ministry of Public Health. We were not little colonial outposts doing our own thing. And I noticed when another research group was working in the country or coming into the country, whether it was Harvard University working with another hospital across town that we were not involved with, I thought this was fine. I didn't think that we should claim that they should stay away and, uh, and not get involved. There's there are plenty of provinces and plenty of disease to study. My only suggestion would be, you know, let's uh, use the deconfliction as it's now being used in, in Syria, which is, you know, we're working, someone else is doing work in Chiang Mai, and Chiang Mai is a lovely place to work. That's why I spend half the year now. But there were other research groups working in Chiang Mai, so I said, well, when we set up our project of female sex workers, a cohort, let's do it in a different province. And fortunately, Dr. Kanchit originally came from Chiang Rai province, so not far from Chiang Mai. So we set one up there, and my only suggestion was, let's avoid trying to be competing over the same patients in the same hospital or the same province, but work together. And so we would often welcome visitors from other um, research universities or, or programs that wanted to do research in Thailand, meet with them, make suggestions and so forth, and say, well, why don't you try over here, and there's nobody involved over there. But I did notice a lot of a different attitude coming from even some people in Atlanta that uh, we, don't wanna, we don't want those people, we want to be first to discover something. We don't want them to be to discovered first, so let's not cooperate. In fact, I remember we had been working with the Thai ministry and their regional and provincial health offices to collect specimens of various types. And those specimens eventually were sent to Atlanta with the cooperation of the, the Thais for storage and study and analysis. But then the Japanese wanted to get some of these specimens. And so we worked out what we thought would be something called a material transfer agreement. The Thais said fine, because the Japanese had been running the or had, been, had built the Thai National Institutes of Health next door to our offices. Yeah. And that's where most of the laboratory work was being right. done. And they would send their researchers over there. And Yutaka Takebi was one of those researchers. And we got along fine with him. We worked together on some manuscripts. But when his institution in Tokyo wanted to get some specimens that we had processed, and they were Thai specimens we had sent to CDC, we drew up a materials transfer agreement, and there were some certain personalities back in Atlanta in the lab that didn't want to send those specimens to Japan. Why? They, they weren't their specimens. They belonged to the Thai 
people in the Thai government. So I, so that MTA never succeeded, mm -hmm. and I thought that type of competitive, you know, we're not going to share our specimens, is not the way science should be working. You know, the right. science works best when people publish their results and help out other researchers in the same field, and not be constantly struggling to be the first and and uh, freeze out their competitors in mm. that respect. Very interesting. I still um, wonder what the community response was to this horrible epidemic, the illness, uh, the death in those days. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? What was your own response? This is such a, a crippling disease in the, even in the early 90s, certainly in, in Asia. Well, I don't, not having experienced clinical uh, AIDS um, institutions in America, because when I came back from working in Thailand on, the, on this AIDS uh, program, I moved to vaccines. So I'm not sure I can say things were that much different. You know, there was the initial uh, resentment, fear, anger, um, uh, s segregation of patients with AIDS or HIV infection in Thailand as we had mm. here. We, we remember all those mm. horror stories. Mm -hmm. um, but as time went on, uh, a more enlightened uh, policies went into effect and Thailand even developed its own AIDS activist groups that would uh, uh, lobby and, and demonstrate and mm. so forth. And now Thailand, through government funding, provides uh, antiretroviral drugs to people who are HIV infected. It's not a big deal. People are surviving longer than they did in, the, in those early days. Um, so I'm not sure I can, I can give you any examples or anecdotes of how things were different there than here. I think you know, most societies uh, face this same evolution Mm -hmm. from horror and fear to acceptance and understanding that if they didn't engage in risky behavior, they weren't at risk from someone sitting next to them in the classroom or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so forth. Um, and I think, though, that Thailand was unique among its neighbors uh, in that region in being more open and willing to publish their results and, and, and to, to, and to um, make their situation be... Uh, known because only when you convince people that you have a problem are they willing to spend the money and, and make the effort to solve it. And if you don't reveal that you have a problem, it's not going to get solved. That's very impressive. Um, anything to say about the Thai people and the Thai society? Um, well, I think I'm biased. Uh, I now uh, work part-time at a university in Thailand, and um, I think the hospitality of the Thai people is is inborn. You don't have to go to hotel school or restaurant school to learn hospitality, and uh, um, they, the Thai people host a number of regional offices of various groups because the quality of life is relatively good. Um, um, it's relatively safe country to work in, and uh, um, I think that made it an advantageous place. And it was also probably the beachhead, at least as far as we can tell from our early serial surveys uh, of how, where, the, where the virus first got into uh, the Asian population and began spreading. What about the beachhead? Well, I, th I, I use a military analogy in the sense that when we, that, that Thailand was probably, in terms of what we know from serial surveys, the first place mm -hmm. where HIV came into the country in the bloodstream of a f either a foreigner or a Thai national returning from overseas. Okay. And then, because the conditions were ripe, given risk behaviors, needle sharing, uh, unprotected sex, and so forth, that it could spread rapidly. Before we close, is there anything else you would like to, to mention about your experience there? This has just been fascinating. 
Um, and I think you are the only or certainly a, one of very few that is t telling us about the epidemic in Asia, and it's incredible. Well, it's now been, what, 35 plus years since I first went to Thailand in 1983. I have to do the arithmetic. Uh, I think um, the longer I have experience in living, visiting, working in Thailand and, and knowing the Thai people, I see the benefit of the FETP. A few years back when we had the avian influenza pandemic, I remember sitting in my kitchen in Atlanta and the BBC or one of the major news organizations was interviewing one of our early graduates from the FETP, Dr. Supermit Chonsutiwat, a really remarkable fellow who was eloquently explaining to the reporter how Thailand was working on this problem uh, that had been found in, uh, in Thailand, uh, among other countries in Southeast Asia. And I thought, this is the, the fruit, the payback for all those efforts, starting with Dave Brandley Bennett in 1980 with five trainees. Now it's been, they have hundreds of them. Some of them don't work in epidemiology. Some of them maybe went into clinical practice, some, 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 many of them remained in the ministry. They're now reaching the highest levels of, of uh, the civil service, where they're now running departments and running divisions and running uh, um, various parts of the, of the public health system. And we're getting the benefits of that training of the epidemi of the FETP, because in a sense, I consider epidemiology to be the science of health. It's sort of the, it's the queen of, of, of research methodology. It's basically the, sci uh, the epidemiology is the application of the scientific method to health problems. And now we're seeing the payback from that investment. And CDC off and on over this 35 plus years has sent staff, has sent some funds has sent uh, short-term and long-term uh, short-term consultants and long-term advisors to work with not only Thailand but other countries around the world and the payback is there and this has nothing to do with my own experience but when I saw in the press what CDC had done and was doing to stop the Ebola epidemic pandemic or epidemic in Africa it made me very proud, and there must have been literally thousands of person months of CDC people going there, making their families worried to, to death about that, the danger they faced. But when I think of how close this world came, if that virus had gotten out of that region, and Nigeria did a wonderful job keeping it from spreading to that uh, Metrop met, you know, major metropolis area, if it had gotten into other parts of the world in Asia or South America, the world really just missed, missed a terrible tragedy. And uh, I think CDC gets a lot of credit for that. And the, the, the people in Nigeria who stopped it were epidemiologists in training. And I thought uh, uh, this was sort of proof of what Phil Brockman and others started way back when they began taking um, uh, the original EIS model overseas. And uh, it made me very proud that this agency had been very much involved in helping stop what happened in West Africa with Ebola. And uh, whew, uh, it was, it, we came very close to a disaster if it had ever gotten out of that region. I'd like to close with just a few questions about the personal aspects of your work. You've covered some of them. Did you worry about becoming infected yourself or about your safety or your family's safety during these early years? You mean in terms of the Getting HIV? HIV. Not really, because I think by that time we knew how this disease was spread, and uh, and uh, 
we knew what precautions to take, uh, don't share needles, uh, don't engage in certain behaviors, and uh, uh, so I wasn't really concerned. Of course, we had a laboratory, and we had to make sure the lab people were, were protected, uh, uh, but no, that wasn't really an issue. I think I tell people, in, in some countries, you know, there's civil disorder and unrest and, and risks, and certainly many CDC people are in parts of the world that are very dangerous, and I worry about those still working in polio eradication in some very dangerous places for political reasons. But I tell people in Thailand the most likely thing that's going to cause a tragedy is automobile vehicles and trucks. And I tell anyone who goes to Thailand, look both ways when crossing the street, because you never know. There's a lot of people coming down the wrong way on a one-way street. In fact, I tell my family this story about a week or two after first going to Thailand in 1983 with the FETP. I was crossing a major one-way road with like four lanes in one direction. And the traffic was stopped by a traffic light. And so I was thinking I was about a 50 meters ahead of the, the vehicles all stopped and I was gonna quickly jaywalk across the street. And there was a policeman on the other side of the street and I thought, and he, he shook his head. I was about ready to step into the, the, the street to get across before the light turned. And I thought to myself, well, you know, I just got to the country a week or so ago. I'm, I don't want to get arrested for jaywalking. I need to be on my best behavior. And just at that second, when I decided not to step into the street, they had a, a one-way bus lane just for buses going the opposite way on the one-way street. They went right in front of my nose. There's no question that if I, that policeman had not been there, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> so I tell everyone I know going to Thailand, look both ways all the way across the street, not at your cell phone. And that's, I think, the most practical advice I can give. Thanks very much. That's been terrific.